For Those Who Are Politically Wise, a show about the lives of Christians in Ohio involved with politics. Introducing your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Greetings, my fellow patriots, saints, and sinners. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. At the end of the show, there will be a blessing. Don't miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Next time you're thinking about beating the train, think again. It takes a typical freight train traveling 50 miles an hour, one and a half miles to stop. That's nearly 18 football fields. Don't try to beat the train. Ohio's roads can be highways or dieways. The choice is yours. A message from Operation Lifesaver and this station. The opinions and statements on this show belong to those who give them. The rest of the show belongs to Thomas Wise Words, all rights reserved. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. This is Reverend Thomas Wise. The show is called Politically Wise. I'm interviewing Representative Richard Adams. Sir, tell us, tell my viewers about yourself. Well, I've been involved in politics now for several years, and this followed my retirement at age 51. I've been involved in politics now, education, banking, and I've enjoyed all of it, and I believe uh, that the work in the legislature can best be described as what citizen legislators ought to be doing, and I view myself in that regard. I'm willing to take my turn, somewhat like when we had my wife Sandy and I have three children, and when they were young and involved in Little League Baseball, I took my turn as a coach, and I see serving as a legislature a similar experience in that I'm taking my turn as a legislator, and when I am accomplished what I believe I can do, or run into term limits, then I'll return back to the community and someone else can take their turn representing their constituents in the district. This is my fifth year as a legislator. Some of this, I think, is based upon my work in the area of education. I'm a three-time graduate of the Ohio State University with a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Arts, and a Ph.D. You've been... At this for five years. Yes. Tell me what a good day or a bad day in politics would be. Well, for me, I think every day is a good day. I like to get up early in the morning, and I'm, I enjoy being busy. I enjoy working with people. I'm, I enjoy being around people who share goals for, in this case, what needs to be done and can be done in the legislature. Politics, politicians, those may not be positive words from the perspective of a lot of people. And I can understand why that may be the case. I myself see things happening, especially in Washington, D.C., that I wonder about in terms of it may be politically correct, but is it, is, is it in the best interest of the citizens that are represented and in the best interests of our country as an institution. So from that standpoint, uh, I, I'm, I'm an optimist. Uh, I think that we can make things better. I'm not easily discouraged. I think we can continue to work hard. I believe that we can convince people with logic as the major strategy. So on that basis, uh, I like the process. I I like the hearing process where any citizen can come to Columbus and come before a committee of legislators and say what they want to say, respond to questions, and be thanked for for coming. So I I like this process. I think it's a good one. uh, My wife and I like to travel. We've, I think, uh, toured now some 57 countries. And in some countries, people do not have the benefits 
of the freedom that we enjoy in this country. And so we don't want to take, we really don't want to assume that that's the case. We don't want to uh, not follow the process. We need to support the process and we need to make sure that the process is good for all those individuals who want to be a part of the process. Let me ask this question. You can answer this any way you want, but how does your faith play a role in, in your work? Well, I am a Christian. I've been a Christian all my life. Uh, I was uh, you know, brought up in the church. Uh, there was a time when I thought well, maybe I'd be called to the ministry, but uh, I never felt that calling. <laughs> and so consequently, uh, I became a school teacher first and then moved on to some other things that uh, I found to be interesting. So uh, I believe that, you know, there is a divine plan. Now, my mother-in-law, since deceased, had something she liked to say, and one, and so I asked her if she would, she did embroidering, and I said, would you mind embroidering that, and I'd like to frame it, and uh, put it uh, where I can see it from time to time, and basically it was this, uh, uh, ask God's blessings on your work, but don't ask God to do your work. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, a good philosophy for all of us to think about. So, you know, I pray daily, and I pray for those things that uh, help me to fulfill what I believe is the appropriate course of action, realizing that there is certainly an overall plan, and I may not understand it fully, and I... Want to, but I do want to contribute to the fulfillment of those things that I believe are in the best interest of, of people. And so consequently, uh, you know, my faith, in fact, I've got, you can't see it from where we're seated now, but I've got uh, in my office a uh, framed copy of the Ten Commandments where I can see it daily. And I believe those uh, Ten Commandments uh, are important. And all of us need to remember them. And if we follow those Ten Commandments, not only will we have an opportunity to fulfill those things that are important from the perspective of our faith, but I think it's also going to benefit the people that we serve. And we will be right back after the break. Partnership with Liberty Prayer Network. Hi, I'm Matt Staver, founder and chairman of Liberty Council. We'll talk about this next on Freedom's Call. An intercessory prayer ministry has now officially merged with Liberty Council and brought to life the Liberty Prayer Network. Through prayer, we will intercede for the United States, biblically-based public policy, and champions of life, liberty, and the family. While praying for our nation, we remain committed to standing with Israel and partnering with those from other nations who uphold religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family. We are enlisting prayer patriots to take a stand in their home states, lifting high the torch of liberty and calling others to worship God and to pray for His blessings. If you would like to join the Liberty Prayer Network, call us today at one 800 671-1776. That's 800-671-1776. Or visit our website at lc.org. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. People that we serve. How do you keep your head and your heart clear with all the noise and static, you know, particularly like times when we have things like SB5 and everybody's banging on the walls and hollering and, or the worst part, the little whispers that, you know, want to pull you one way and pull you the other way? Well, sometimes it's a matter of considering the source. And, you know, I like to associate with people who are positive in their outlook, people who are <clears throat> interested in doing those things that fulfill the same objectives that I have in terms of how we ought to be serving people. On the other hand, I think it's also important for us to listen to individuals who have different thoughts, individuals who have a different perspective based upon their environment or their attitude or what else may have an influence on what they believe is important. And I, I think we need to do that from the standpoint of listening to others. It stretches our thinking, and it also gives us an idea of the kinds of things that we ought to be doing if we're going to include those persons in the overall decision-making process. How do you handle, how do you handle the reading 
You know, I, need the, I, I don't want to notice that you probably got the cleanest desk, and I, th- I understand you just got her. <laughs> well, actually, I've, I've been here. I was here all day yesterday, and I uh, came in this morning early and, and began. I, I like the clean desk uh, procedure. Uh, I, I like to stay well organized, and I appreciate that and people who work with me. So the fact that I have a clean desk may be indicative of the reading I did last night. And it's, uh, first of all, as a legislator, it is important that you enjoy reading and that you're capable of reading and retaining. Because we work on so many different issues at one time. Consequently, you need to have good recall of what you've read. So I... I'm a fast reader. And I retain it well. I've always enjoyed reading. One thing has happened, however. I no longer have the time for recreational reading. When I read something, it's usually associated with my work or somewhat indirectly reading newspapers. I read a couple of news magazines on a regular basis so that I can I read about five newspapers. I want to stay informed in terms of what's going on, but also I benefit from reading letters to the editor because it gives me an idea of what people are thinking. And in some cases, you can agree. In other cases, you wonder how in the world they ever reached that conclusion. So I've been known to call people and indicate, I read your letter to the editor, and I'd like to talk about your thoughts. So reading is maybe the most important, at least one of the most important talents anybody who is a legislator or works for the public should have. Well, how do you how do you handle those phone calls? You know, the guy comes up and says, comes up, calls you up and choose you out, choose your your, your aide out, choose everybody else out, and then then once you call him back. You know, I've often wondered why some people think that if they're obnoxious, that if they're arrogant, if they're demanding, if they're crude, why they think that behavior is going to cause me or the people I work with to try even harder to help them. I I don't understand that logic. Now, frequently, I have to tell people, you know, we're not going to talk anymore if you're going to use that kind of language. You calm down and call me back. I'll be glad to talk to you, but we're not going to continue this conversation as it's currently going on. So most people, when they recognize that that sort of behavior is not productive, uh, are much, much more willing to become a part of the solution instead of just hammering me or one of my associates with whatever the problem may be. There's no doubt that some people are more enjoyable to work with than others. There is no doubt. But I try to work with everybody on the basis that maybe their frustration is because they've tried to solve this problem and they cannot solve this problem. So that's an important part, I think, of being a legislator is to be a good listener, sometimes under difficult circumstances, and maintain your, I cannot think of a single time that I've lost my temper dealing with a colleague or a constituent. Sometimes that's not easy, but I think it's important that we maintain a very professional attitude on the basis of helping a person in spite of themselves. Yeah, I mean, something's really got to be going wrong for anybody to really raise their voice publicly, Mm. you know. Mm. Yes, you're right. You're right. And, but, you know, that's such a small percentage. Yeah. Yeah. Of the people that I work with on a day-to-day basis, week in, week out, I'm guessing at the percentage, but I'd say it's 98% of people need help, and they're appreciative when you help them. Mm. You know, a lot of people think that, as lawmakers, that's mostly what we do. Well, there is a lot of lawmaking going on. Fortunately, not all of it becomes law. We have uh, this last year in the House something like 368 bills introduced. That's a lot of laws. 
Well, only about 58 of them ever got out of here and went over to the Senate, and only about 29, I believe it is, of those were actually signed by the governor. So we have a lot of laws to consider, and fortunately not many of them get passed. None of my constituents have ever said to me, Representative Adams, we need more laws. Most of my, most of my constituents, they're saying, don't pass any more laws. You know, just leave us alone. You know, the folks I represent are very self-reliant, and they're going to uh, do their best. They're hard workers, and uh, they're respectful, and they're delightful to work with. Having said that, there's still some that believe that most of what you do is lawmaking. Not true. I would say 70, maybe 75% of my time is spent with constituents who need information or need help. Now, it's frustrating to me that one of my constituents dealing with state government must come to me and say, I'm having trouble with state government. It seems to me that everybody in state government ought to have the attitude that we work for the citizens. They don't work for us. Now, it's gotten a lot better. In the last uh, few years, I think state government has become more user-friendly, especially with employers. They, but sometimes they just, they know they have a problem, but they don't know where to go to get help for the problem. We can be helpful. We should be helpful, and I'm glad to do it. Do you have a, a case in point that you can share with us? Yeah, I had a, uh, yes, I do. I had a, a fellow call me and uh, indicated that his son was uh, delinquent in his child support. And he said his son had his driver's license taken away from him. We don't do that, at least to the extent that we once did that. And he said, and as a result, uh, I've been, it's been necessary for me to help him. He said, so I'm, I was retired, but he said, now I've got a job. He said, I'm so pleased that Walmart gave me a job. And he said, I enjoy the work, but he says it's difficult being on my feet. Mm -hmm. all day long. He said, but I'm helping pay the child support and helping my son get his car fixed so he can look for a job. He says, is there anything you can do to help me? So I called Job Family Services and we talked and, and one of the things we did was to get this fellow's driver's license so that he could look for a job and then get to work. And I didn't think any more about it. And I'd say maybe five, six weeks later, this fellow called me again. Hmm. He was a little emotional. And before we were done, I was starting to get that way. He said, I'm just calling to tell you how much I appreciate what you did for me and my family. He said, my son got his car fixed. He got a job. He's getting up to date on his child support payments. And I was able to retire once again from Walmart. <laughs> so, you know, it's a great story. And usually I don't hear the end of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you go through the help with information or assistance, but you don't hear how it turned out. So I, I was delighted that I received a report on what had happened. Mm -hmm. It's positively enforcing to me, too, to know that good things can happen and you know, most people who are in elected office are interested in doing those things that are positive for their community. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Do you pray for a politician? Do you think a politician can be a Christian? Do you think a politician should stand up for Christian principles? Do you think politicians should pray together? Do you want to see more Christians in politics? If you said yes to any of these questions, please join the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network. Find the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network on Facebook. Welcome back to Politically Wise. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. You mentioned uh, you, a number of bills. You've been you've been a representative here for five years. Mm -hmm. um, are you are you going to go on? Are you going to run for re-election again? Are you going to retire? Or? No, I'm going to retire at the end of this uh, 
2014. So my retirement will be effective January 1, 2015. People wonder why you don't go on until term limits mm -hmm. cause you to leave the legislature. Before I came over here, I made a list of what I wanted to accomplish. Mm. I've been working on those things. All those things have been checked off. Really? Now, there's some things that we're going to have to fine-tune a little bit, and but I've got 2014 to do that, and I believe it can be done. I'm not going to add any things to my list. There's never a good time to quit doing something you enjoy because there's always new things come along. You think, yeah, I'd be interested in that. We ought to work. I ought to work on that. Yeah, I could be a part of that. So you need to say, this is what I want to do. Now, I've added some things to the list simply because of the opportunity to make a difference. But I'm not going to go beyond what is somewhat of an artificial point of stopping. Although the reality is that I will have served my community for six years. When I, when I went to become a county commissioner, uh, I was urged to do that. The county had financial difficulty. Bond rating was in jeopardy. The county commissioners were not getting along. The elected officials were not getting along. The courthouse literally was falling down. Uh, the district judge was going to throw the sheriff in jail because we didn't have enough room for prisoners. So I made a list out of those things that needed to be done. And those things that I mentioned as well as we did not have a facility f to do any recycling. Our transfer station was inadequate. We had EPA findings. So there's just a lot. That was a long list. We had uh, no bicycle trails. Well, I, I like to bicycle, and I think bicycle trails dedicated are good for our community. And even more so now, they're kind of an expectation that people have. And as I told the folks who want me to run, I said, I'll serve one term for sure, two terms if necessary, but if things aren't working in eight years, you've got the wrong guy. So at the end of the eight years, I refused to accept the nomination to be reelected. Maybe it was a mistake because I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed my work as county commissioner. Board of Elections, I stopped that when we had the problem solving. In Miami County, on election day, the previous board of election and staff ran out of ballots in 22 precincts in the middle of the afternoon on election day. Hmm. Well, the Secretary of State fired everybody, and then I was urged to join the board of elections. We were on administrative oversight by the state for over two years. But once we had a restoration not only of the state's approval, but also a restoration of the public's confidence mm -hmm. in the board of elections, mm -hmm. I quit hmm. until I was suggest it was suggested it was urged that I run for the uh, to be a state representative, which I've enjoyed too. But this community, this has been community service for me. There's when I came here, there was nothing I wanted, nothing that they could offer me, nothing they could take away from me. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm leaving feeling great about what's been accomplished and what I've been able to contribute to the process. So how many bills has the governor that you, you know, efforts that you put in, how many, how, what's, what's, I was saying, you know, I, it's, it's a team effort. I know it's a lot of folks, but you know, you, you have a, you have a piece of you, piece of it, part how many bills have that been? Yeah, I've been the lead sponsor on five bills, and my philosophy has always been you can accomplish a lot if you don't care who gets the credit. Mm. And consequently, I've been willing to uh, get behind others who had a bill that uh, I thought was necessary, and I've opposed some bills that I thought were inappropriate or not needed. So it's been a matter of playing offense and playing defense, but we have 99 members of the House, mm -hmm. and if we all have a bill passed each year, that's a lot of bill. That's a lot of new laws. And so consequently, we're, we're at the governor's arm. <laughs> that's true. And so consequently, I follow what one of my colleagues has said. That he was here before uh, term. He was here as a part of term limits, and before term limits started, actually. And consequently, he served a number of years, well beyond the eight that we have now. 
and uh, he said that during the time that uh, he was in the legislature, coincidentally, he said he had five bills passed, and uh, upon which he was the lead sponsor. And he said every night he starts his prayers by asking God to forgive him. <laughs> well, he, he may have been jesting, but I think the advice would you give somebody falling in your footsteps? Well, I think it's important to want to serve for all the right reasons. Now, there's no doubt we need some people who, with the experience of elected office, seek another elected office and maybe a higher elected office. And I recognize that. Now, individuals shouldn't begin as a state legislator with the idea that they want to be governor or they want to be the state treasurer or they want to be a member of Congress or they want to be a U.S. Senator. In politics and in public service, it's very difficult to form an opportunity, but you can be prepared if an opportunity is presented for you to take on additional responsibilities. So consequently, my advice is be the kind of state legislator that you would want to be because of no other job even being available. It's a matter of doing the best you can rather than do what needs to be done in order for you to move on to that next step. That next step will happen if you do a good job at what you're presently doing. The other thing I believe is important is to be able to keep things in perspective. Some of that, I think, is your relationship with your religious faith. Some of that, I think, is because of the support of your family. Legislators make a sacrifice in terms of their family. You spend time away from home. You may be going to movie or church or to the grocery store with your wife or your kids. And somebody, oh, I'm glad I ran into you. <laughs> I've, been, I've been meaning to call you <laughs> or send you a letter. And so, you know, it's a, it's a 24-7 job. You, you're always a legislator. And people, and I'm not uncomfortable with that. If that's the best way for them to contact me, fine. I'll give them my card and we'll go from there. But you need to enjoy that sort of thing. You need to look at that as a positive aspect of the job because, indeed, you are serving others. Yes. And I want to tell my listeners I can sit here and I can see the Bible on his sideboard. Yes. And so I, uh, I take to heart what you're saying here. So. Well, it, religion, I think, is an important part of everybody's life and uh, you know, if people who may not have a religious perspective can become acquainted with the teachings of Jesus, the Son of God, and how he said we should live our lives, we would all benefit from attempting to live our lives in the manner that he has suggested. Amen. Thank you again for your time today. The, the show is called Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. I'm interviewing uh, Representative uh, Adams here in his office at the State House. Thank you again, sir. Glad to be with you. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Now, here's your blessing. Blessings based on Psalms chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Blessed are you when you say there is a God above all gods. Blessed are you when God sees you from heaven. Blessed are you when you see the Lord. 
Blessed are you when you turn aside from corruption. Blessed are you when God restores your fortune. Blessed are you when God is your refuge.